This is our last lecture on quantitative methods and specifically statistics and econometrics. The lecture is uh, 18 and what I have uh, done here is outline for me quickly the uh, concepts which uh, I will be uh, trying to cover with the next 30-40 minutes. So, what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis effectively is a guess whether something is true or false. An example of a hypothesis will be, well, does fertilizer affect uh, agricultural output? In other words, if we fertilize a little bit more, are we going to be getting a little bit more output? Second hypothesis, different hypothesis, does more rain affect agricultural output? If it rains more, you get more output, all right? Uh, another example, does more sun affect agricultural output? This will be a third hypothesis. So I just gave you three examples of hypothesis related to agriculture. We can come up with any sort of hypothesis. Uh, if you remember from last time, the example of the model was advertising expenditures and sales. Well, if we actually advertise aggressively, are we going to boost sales or not? So, the hypothesis has a meaning of true or false, true or not true. And what is a test? Well, test is in this particular case a statistical procedure by which we attempt to verify whether the hypothesis is valid or not. Okay, so hypothesis usually is accepted or rejected. Statistically, we can only reject the hypothesis. If we reject the hypothesis, we run a conclusion. Then, in statistics, we say we do not say that we accept the hypothesis. We say that we, can, we cannot reject the hypothesis as opposed to accepting it. All right? So, the testing is some sort of a procedure, a statistical procedure, that has the objective to verify a particular hypothesis. So, we say to test that hypothesis. All right, so when we run a model, a statistical model, we get statistical results. You can have a statistically significant result for one parameter, you can get a statistically significant result for two parameters, or you can get a statistically significant result for the whole model altogether. So, what does it mean in this particular case, significant? Significant means that the st statistical procedure told you that by all likelihood, by a very high degree of confidence and a very high degree of probability, the result is true and the result is valid. In other words, when you reject it, you most likely rejected for a good reason. Most likely it was not due to some statistical randomness, but it was due, due uh, it was a result of a real change. So, statistically significant, that's what it means. It means that the result is true and the result is valid. Most likely, we can say with a 99% degree of confidence because the relationship is true and not because it just happened by the circumstances or by the pure randomness of data. Alright, so what we usually do, as I explained, is you get an estimator. An estimator, let's remind, is a formula by which you get an estimate or compute the value of an estimate, the value of a particular parameter. So, 
What does unbiased mean? I think I explained it last time, right? Unbiased means that if you run the experiment a second time, of course the experiment is random, you will get a second value for the parameter, a second estimate of the parameter. Then, when you run a third experiment, you will get a third estimate for that particular parameter. If you run a fourth experiment, a fourth estimate. So, when you take the average of all of these estimates, that average will approximate the true genuine value. So, if the true, true value, let's say, is 5, maybe based on some physics, when you run the first experiment, you get 4.98. When you run the second, you're going to 4.99. On the third one is 504. On the next one is 501. On the next one is 506. On the next one is 491. All right. So, the first experiment, estimate. It's second estimate, third estimate, and if you run a lot of estimates, when you take the average between these two, in other words, you sum them up, it will give you the average of 5.01. Of course, 501 is still not the same as 5. If you run infinitely many estimates, then the average will be tending towards 1. It will be converging towards 1, all right? So, this is what unbiased means, all right? So, unbiased does not mean that you get the exact true parameter. It only means that if you are taking sufficiently many samples and su ran sufficiently many experiments, your estimate will be getting closer and closer and closer to the true value, all right? So, this is what unbiased estimator means. And in statistics, you always prefer, whenever possible, to use estimators that are unbiased. So, many of these estimates which we do for the parameters of alpha and beta in a regression, they are actually unbiased, okay? But the important point to remember is that just because it's unbiased, it does not necessarily mean that it's going to give you a true value. Unbiased mathematically means that the expected value of the estimate equals the true parameter. The expected value of the estimate simply means that if you run sufficiently many times and you take the average over the estimates, that's the meaning of expected value, you will get actually the true value. Alright, so the next concept is that of a t-test. A t-test is effectively a test that runs a hypothesis. So, what is a t-test? Well, first of all, we got to see when we run an estimate, let's say, uh, we try to do a regression and we try to test for the slope. And the slope was, if you remember, the parameter of beta, actually the tangency of uh, beta from last time. Well, what we want to test is whether the parameter, parameter beta is zero or not zero. So, when we want to test that it's zero, we say that the null hypothesis is that beta is zero, okay? And the alternative hypothesis, H1, is that beta is not zero. So, what we would try to do in this particular case is to test whether beta is different from zero. In other words, if we can reject this. Okay, what does it mean to reject? To reject in this particular case 
means that beta is effectively significant. Okay, so now let's explain what significant means. I already did. It simply means when you're putting more fertilizer, you're getting more yield. Well, why is it uh, beta zero? Well, what does beta zero mean? It means that it is not just a straight line. There are always straight lines, but it is horizontal. Oh, sorry, parallel to the horizontal axis. What does it mean? You use one kilo of fertilizer, the expected value, remember we also call it fitted value or predicted value, is seven pounds of yield for whatever. If you use two kilograms of fertilizer, you get the same value of seven. You use three, you still get the same value of seven. You use, let's say, 13, you still get seven. Well, if you use one, two, three, or 13, or zero, and you get seven, of course it is not significant, all right? It simply means that it's not significant. Now, if it is significant, it must be that beta is in our particular case, I've chosen it that way because of common business sense. You fertilize more, you expect to get more. So, in this particular case, we have that the alternative is actually positive. Beta is positive. So, in this particular case, beta is positive. Well, what does it mean to be positive? If you're running, oh, sorry, fertilizing with one kilogram, you get an expected value of three. With two kilograms, you get an expected value of five. With three kilograms, you're getting an expected value of seven. With four kilograms, you're getting an expected value of nine. All right, this is simply what it means, okay? Well, you run your first experiment and you get one estimate of a beta. You run your second experiment, you get a different estimate of a beta. You get a third experiment, you get a third estimate of a beta. So, your estimates themselves will be random. And your estimates yourself will have a standard error. Remember, over here I gave you, and the standard error to me, anyone with a calculator can probably compute it, but the standard error to me on an inspection by eye is sigma equals, sigma in this particular case of beta equals, anyone, any rough idea, what's the rough number? Like two, three, one, one hundred? What's the standard error here? Well, the standard error inspection by eye is about 0 0.02. Well, it could be 0 0.03 or it could be 0 0.01. I mean, you can still punch the numbers and get sigma. It's going to come up with a number close to 0 0.02. All right, so 0 0.02 is our standard error running six experiments. And the average is actually 501. Does it look to you that... Five is a reasonable average, five is a good estimate? And the answer is intuitively yes. And the answer statistically is yes, of course. Now, let's provide a different set of betas that will average five. Let's provide the following. You estimate one, you estimate seven, you estimate zero, you estimate 21, you estimate 3, you estimate, let's say, well, I gotta get a small number, all right? So, now, you see what happens? You get 0, 3, 21, 0, 7, 1. Well, suppose the average is, suppose the average is 5. How would it be 5? Six numbers, they have to add up to 30. So, I'm saying 21, 7, 0, 
zero, the average is five. All right. So these. Oops. Let's and let's say two, and let's say two. Okay. So what you are now seeing is two zero twenty one zero seven zero. Uh, the sum is 30 divided by 6, the average is 5. Are you confident in this estimate? Are you confident in this estimate? Well, not anymore. We are definitely not sure. By looking at it, say, wow, out of 3 out of 6 experiments, it had no effect. So, for these 3 experiments, Maybe the effect was genuine, meaning fertilizer did affect. Maybe it wasn't the fertilizer at all. Maybe it was just the rain, or maybe it was the sun, or maybe it was the moon. All right? So now we are definitely not confident. Let's try to provide. So here someone can punch in and we'll come up with a sigma of probably four or maybe even five. Well, let's provide an even more, a little more extreme example. Uh, plus 15 is our first estimate. The second estimate is uh, minus, uh, what is it going to be? Minus 10, is it? I got to add up the numbers. So it's minus 5, minus 5, plus 20, minus 10 plus 25 minus 15. Now, I've created a new series which again averages 5, but now you see, oh, the first one was plus 15. The second one says, the more you fertilize, the less your output. The third one says, oh, even more fertilizer has even stronger effect, but then this says, oh, more fertilization has a terribly negative effect. Well, a person with just common sense and no business statistics course will say, well, maybe this result simply says that fertilizer is not part of the equation, meaning it is not output, is not affected by fertilizer. Maybe something else works there, like rain, sun, whatever, all right? So, in this particular case, the sigma is tiny. Sigma is tiny. Sigma of beta is 0.002. Here, the sigma will be, let's do this, sigma of beta, 0.002. Here, it's going to be like 4, and here, the error could be easily 10, maybe 5, maybe 10. Again, you can just compute the number. But this is what it's going to look like. All right, so what do we want to do? How do we uh, perform a decent statistical test? Well, we take the, this is a beta, and we take the sigma. If the sigma is relatively small and the beta is relatively large, you are fairly confident that the beta is good, all right? If the ratio between the two of them, beta is large, but it turns out that its own error is large, maybe it is not. In this particular case, beta is tiny, but its error, error is so huge that probably this is certainly not good, all right? Probably this is also not really good, and probably this is fairly good. So. What I'm now giving you intuitively is the explanation of the t-test. What the t-test does is provide a statistical procedure, provide a statistical procedure to test whether the parameter beta and also our alpha are statistically significant or not. And the t-ratio is this particular ratio. The estimate of the slope parameter, in other words, beta, divided by its own standard deviation. Sometimes we say S of beta, and sometimes we say sigma of beta. S is the actual 
standard error and sigma of beta is the estimate of the standard error. In other words, when we're providing or making a statistical estimation, you estimate the value of beta, 4.91, but you also separately estimate the variance of that beta. So you're effectively getting two estimates, one of the parameter and one of the variance of the parameter. Well, when you divide this by this, you actually get the T ratio. So the T ratio is dividing the parameter, the estimate of the parameter, to the estimate of the variance of the parameter. That's the T ratio. Okay? And it turns out that the T ratio is a proper, valid statistical test. It has proper, uh, proper uh, properties like unbiasedness, consistency, and all the good statistical stuff that we are not covering. So it turns out that this is actually a very good test to verify whether the, it is statistically significant or not. Actually, statistically, it can be proven this is the best possible test that you can ever get, the best attainable test that you can get. And when you compute the ratio, in this particular case, 5 divided by 4, the ratio is, in this example, 125, okay? In this example, the ratio is 0.5, and in this particular example, the ratio is 251, divided by 0 0.02 is the same as multiplying by 50, right? So when you multiply by 50, 5 by 50, you get 250, and 50 by 0 0.01, you will actually get 250.5. particular number that we get, we simply call the t-statistic, okay? So, the t-test is the statistical procedure for verifying whether the parameter, in our particular case, beta, is significant or not. The t-ratio is the particular formula. The t-ratio is effectively the estimator, all right? The t, so, no, it's not estimate. The, is the formula by which we actually see whether it's true or not. Finally, the t statistic itself is the number that we get. 250, 125, or 0.5. And we end up with the final is the critical value of t. Critical value is that value which allows you or which allows you to conclude whether you can reject or not. For example, critical value usually is around 2, but maybe 2.5. Critical values you look up in a table. So a critical value of 2 means when the T statistic is less than 2, you cannot reject, okay? And if the T statistic is greater than 2, then you can reject. In other words, in this particular case, uh, let me wipe this off because I won't need it at least for this particular example. So, let's call this case 1, case 2, case 3. So, for case 1, we say that the T statistic, T statistic, 250.5, is greater than this one, which is the critical, critical value. Uh, let's do this critical value here, okay? So the critical value, 
and then we say that uh, test we say reject the null hypothesis we reject the null hypothesis and then you conclude that it is statistically significant 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 in case two what happens is uh, the t statistic is 1.5 greater than 2 so cannot cannot reject cannot reject and therefore we say that it is insignificant or not statistically significant isn't it less than 2 Yes, that's, that, that, that's exactly the point. The test is whether the critical value is greater, uh, sorry, the, uh, the statistic is greater than 2. If it is greater than 2, in this particular case, let, let me clarify, in this particular case, we say yes, the same as true, okay? In this particular case, we say, is this true? And the answer is no, or not true, or we sometimes, for short sake, false, okay? So, this is the test itself. This is uh, test, all right? So, what is the test in this particular case? The test is that the, uh, let's see, that the T statistic, T statistic, the computed T, so sometimes call it T0, is greater than T critical. Crit stands for critical value. Remember, critical value is the value, the borderline value for which you can, you know, cannot say anything. If it's larger than the critical value, then you reject. If it's smaller, then you cannot statistically reject. So, this is case two. And, of course, now uh, it's very easy to see that uh, 0.5 greater than 2, again, cannot, cannot reject and it is insignificant okay that makes sense well just repeat so case 3 is exactly the same as case 2 because the statistic the t, the t statistic was in both cases less than the critical value so what you need to do is usually books will give you table with critical values with the t statistics where you can just look up and say oh the t value is 2.3 or 2.7 all right so we covered this reject means that it is actually significant in this particular case reject implies significance so now we say uh, or specify just explain what is a type 1 error so Type 1 error simply means that when you did your statistical result, when you did your statistical testing, you actually found it to be significant when in reality it was not. All right? I mean, you can always get, for example, these tests are usually used, for example, very commonly used for medical drugs like medicine. So. A pharmaceutical company develops a brand new medicine and it wants to test it. Well, how does it test it? Well, get 50 people, you know, which uh, they give them the drug and then 50 people, they give them something else, which is not a drug. We'll call it a placebo. And you put them on the same diet. They're all fat guys. And what you want to see is those that are taking the real drug is being on that diet they lose more than the other guys, all right? So these guys on average lose 10 kilograms, 
the other guys on average on the same diet lose 9 kilograms. Because everyone had the same diet, the 1 kilogram difference is usually explained by the, explained by the pill, by the medicine. Well, when you're running a statistical test of 20 here and 20 there, maybe those 20 here just lost 10 instead of 9 for purely random reason. You know, they were more active, or two years younger, or had some other problems, or lack of problems. So, it may be that the one extra kilogram that you got out of the pill was not a real, real kilogram, but it was just due to some other random events, alright? Maybe the one guys were having a lunch at 12, the other were having a lunch at 1 o'clock. I mean, it could be 101 different reasons. So, the one measures 9, the other one measures 10, and you conclude that the pill is effective and that the pill contributes 1 kilogram of weight loss. Well, in reality, the pill might not be working. And then you're committing a type 1 error. You conclude that it is actually working. Significant means the pill works, right? But in reality, it is not. All right? So, of course, what I'm trying to say here is that these statistical tests are not perfect. Just because you are testing 20 guys here and 20 guys there, it could happen that these 20 guys, some of them actually have a city culture, other have a village type culture, right? And just because of the culture, you have 15 guys here that are from the city and the other uh, sample have 5 from the city. It could be a whole bunch of other reasons. And you conclude that it's valid, but it's not. That's what we call type 1 error. Type 2 error is the exact opposite. You conclude that it is insignificant when in reality it is. So, you run the same test. 20 guys here, 10 guys, uh, 20 guys there. You test the pill. The pill says you're losing 10, but these guys are losing 9 on the identical diet. And our test says it is insignificant. Well, type 2 errors who say, well, the pill doesn't work, but in reality, it actually worked, okay? This could happen. So, we call this type 2 errors. So, you should be typically aware of the probability that you're making a mistake. And the probability is chance. It's just the probability. So, this is exactly what the level of significance is. The level of significance gives you the probability to commit type 1 error. So, the level of significance of 1%, sometimes written as 0 0.01, level of significance of 0 0.01 essentially says that you are risking to commit type 1 error with a probability of 0 0.01, which is the same as 1%. Usually this is very common, but you also get a common of 5% or 10%. In other words, depending on the business problem that you have, you would want to make a different error. In other words, you can allow 10% error if the error is no big deal. 1% could be very low, extremely low for some business applications, but could be extremely high for other applications. An example of extremely high 1% is nuclear radiation. You measure the radiation here, you measure the radiation there, you have a nuclear reactor, which is, of course, uh, generating electricity, you run the nuclear reactor, 1% error is a terrible error. You risk 1% of actually radiating your population with the next 10 kilometers or 50 kilometers or 100 kilometer radius. 1% error of just killing the whole population around is certainly not acceptable, all right? For a medical pill that the medical pill doesn't work, 1% error is no big deal, all right? For an advertising budget, you don't even need 1%. Even 5% is okay, even 10%. If you can get it 90% right, it's still good.
All right? So, what is the level of significance? Critically depends on the business problem at hand. If you risk thousands of lives, you want to put in not 1%, you want to put 1 million percent, 1 thousandth of 1%, right? If it's no big deal, then you can just put in 10% and, you know, and live, all right? So, this is exactly what the level of confidence, the level of confidence tells you how confident you can be in your statistical result. And the level of confidence is simply the complement of significance. In other words, if your level of significance was 1%, level of confidence gives you the degree of confidence. So you're good at 99%. So if you're, the probability of making a mistake is 1%, then the probability of not making a mistake is 99%. All right? If the probability of mistake is 5%, then the probability of not making a mistake is 95%. And if the probability of mistake is 10%, then the probability of not making a mistake is 90%. Well, the probability of not making a mistake is simply called level of confidence. You say, oh, I'm 99% confidence, what you call sure, of course, it is the same thing. I'm 99% sure. Well, this simply means significance of 1% or level of confidence, 99%. All right? So, this is what it is. Usually, level of significance and level of confidence add up to 1. A different way of saying is that the level of confidence is 1 minus the level of significance. It is the same thing. All right? It is the same as saying that 1% and 99% <coughs> Excuse me, equal 100%, that 5 and 95 again equal 100, and 10 and 90 equal again 100. All right, next concept, p-value. P-value is sometimes called or known as prob-value or prob-value like this. Of course, you can actually compute your uh, let's see, you can actually compute your t-statistic and when you compute your t-statistic to be 5.6 your t-statistic, okay, you compute it to be 5.6 you can actually compute the level of significance or the level of confidence so when you compute 5.6 you say, oh, I got a level of confidence 99.3%, okay, but if its level of confidence is 99.3%, this means that the level of significance is 1%. Uh, 0.7%, Point, so 99.3, this means 0.7%, all right, so this is... How did you calculate the 99.3? I just made it up. Oh, okay. uh, usually, usually, uh, you can look it up in the table. Okay. Usually when you find 5.6, you look at the table, it gives you 99.3. Okay. Actually, the table will just give you the probability of 0 0.07. In statistics, practically all statistical packages, out of 100 statistical packages, 99 of them will report you both the parameter estimate, will report you also the standard error of the estimate, and will also report you this p-value or the prob value, okay? So, when the prob value is 0.7%, this means that there is a less than 1% chance of committing type 1 error, of, in other words, of reaching the wrong conclusion. Well, what about this? If you have a 250, 250, then the prop value, the prop value will be for 250, the prop value will be 0 0.000001. In other words, the chance is one in a million that 
we made a mistake. In other words, if, the, if we are getting them these numbers and we are asking, well, is this statistically significant? The answer is yes. Well, how likely is that we made a mistake? Well, you look up the 250 in the table, we'll give you one in a million probability. Say, so, oh, the chance of making a mistake is one in a million. Or the probability that we got it right, meaning that it's significant, is actually, you know, 999999, all right? So, this is what the p-value uh, is. In other words, oftentimes in the real business world or just in common sense is rather than asking, well, is it significant or is it not? And say, oh yes, it's significant. It's a lot easier to report. Yes, it's significant at 1% or it's significant at 1.5% or it's significant at 3% or it's significant at 7%. So you get the result and you ask, what is the p-value? And the p-value is, let's say, 3%. And you, as a business person, decide 3% is good enough, okay, or 3% is not good enough, all right? For example, for advertising, is 3% good enough? Yeah. Well, you will have to make a business judgment. We know for a nuclear reactor, no way, even 1% is not enough. For a nuclear reactor, you need this type, one in a million, you need this type of error. That's the required error for a nuclear reactor when you risk thousands of lives, okay? For marketing, maybe it's just perfectly fine. Even 10% might be just okay. It's no big deal. You spend 5,000 or 50,000 on advertising. That, it turns out, didn't work. Well, no big deal, right? <laughs> well, again, it depends on you're going to lose your job if it didn't work. <laughs> Questions? Yes, uh, uh, the problem probability, well, what is it, the value, the p-value, is it the same as the level of significance? Yes, it gives you the, exactly, that's exactly the explanation. It gives you the level of significance. In other words, you work two different ways. One way is you assign beforehand the level of significance and see if it's satisfied or not. So why do we repeat it? No, the alternative approach is you actually compute the level of significance and you see is this good enough for you or not. It depends, it's just a business approach. I mean, the two are identical, but some people like to think in the one way, others like to think in the other way. Uh, one, well, you know, Big Boss says, I demand one in a million strict requirement for the nuclear reactor, all right? You do the testing, you do everything. I mean, for example, you put in how thick, sh thick should be the metal cage. So the whole thing is in a metal cage and you put in 10 centimeter metal cage like this thick, right? It's all steel, so radiation cannot go through steel. And the answer is, boss, we got good level and the level in, we could not satisfy one in a million but we satisfied one in ten thousand all right so the boss says requirement one in a million they design it they test it say boss one in ten thousand are you happy with it can we live with it or we'll have to rework it well what's boss going to say no we have to rework it no, boss says, how much is going to cost me? <laughs> you say, uh, 100 million. Rework. No, 100 million. <laughs> well, the Saudi king may say rework, but in Bulgaria they say, ah, the hell with it. <laughs> All right? <laughs> you got to understand who says it. Uh, then he'll say, uh, in Bulgaria, then he'll say, uh, uh, leave it like that. We don't want to spend an extra 100 million. We'll just pocket it, right? <laughs> But, rework the statistics and fudge the statistical result. You will still report one million, you and me will know it's one in hundred thousand, and we we'll leave it at that, okay? Of course, if you tell somebody else, you won't live long after that, alright? <laughs> so, in, in other words, 
Uh, yes, the requirement was one in a million, but you made a real computation, and the real computation said one in hundred thousand. So someone will make a decision. Yeah, is this good enough, or is it not good enough? They'll say, well, how much is gonna uh, take to rework it? He says uh, half a million. So there's no problem. Spend half a million. But if you say hundred million, say well. I'd rather not spend 100 minutes, way too much money. Uh, let's just run the risk of uh, 1 in 100,000 and live with it. And he may say, well, it's going to cost us 100 million to rework it. Instead, I will authorize an extra million each year for an extensive additional testing. And if 3, 5 or 8 years down the road, we actually get above normal or above acceptable levels of radiation, then we'll spend the money and rework it later, all right? So it says, all right, leave it like this, one million authorized, extra testing, extra measures, and if we see for one, two, three years that the above normal or above acceptable radiation persists, we'll stop for a month, spend the, whatever, 50 or 100 million and rework it, all right? So, again, this will be a business decision, all right? It is not just a statistical decision. So, coefficient of determination is a statistical measure, R squared, which simply tells you or allows you to judge whether the whole model is statistically significant. In other words, right now I was talking about one particular parameter, the parameter of slope. When you compute a model, it may have three variables. It may have rain, sun, and fertilizer. You can test for the rain, you can test for the sun, you can test for the fertilizer separately, but in the end you want to ask the question, well, is my rain, rain sun, fertilizer model overall good or overall not good? Overall statistically significant or not statistically significant? Or overall explaining a lot of the yield or not? Well, R squared, which is coefficient of determination, will tell you how well. In other words, it will tell you the explanatory power of the model. The square root of R squared is just called coefficient of correlation whether the model correlates well with reality or not, with the actually observed variables. And f-statistic is the proper statistic to measure the validity, or we call it statistical significance, of a whole model. The model can have only one parameter, beta. It may have two parameters, alpha and beta, all right? It may have three parameters, alpha, Beta 1 and beta 2, in other words, two independent variables with three parameters. It may have 10 independent variables with 11 parameters. We call it a constant parameter or intercept parameter. So, F statistic is the proper statistic. F statistic is simply the statistic of what is called explained variation by unexplained variation. In other words, when you observe things, the observations have some variation. What you want to find out is, when you run your regression, how much your model explains and how much your model leaves out unexplained. If it explains twice more, this means that the F statistic is 2, alright? In other words, your observations will have a certain variation. Maybe, let's say, 100 units. Your model explains 80, and it remains unexplained 20, all right? Then your F statistic is 80 divided by 20 equal to 4. When you look at the critical values, which are whatever, like around 2, then you see that uh, F value of 4 is giving you the result, allows you to conclude that the model is statistically significant. So, the F statistic is the proper measure for the complete model, while the T statistic is only for testing one particular parameter. 
Alright, so if you have three parameters, you may want to test only for one the fertilizer or you may want to test only one for the rain. Why? If the rain is significant, you can add an irrigation system. Of course, you have to evaluate the cost of the irrigation system versus the benefit or the extra yield. And you can also evaluate the whole model altogether. All right. It may turn to some reason that the statistical parameter is significant, but somehow the whole model is not significant. So you got to see what you want to do. I mean, you're going to be having a statistician. And finally, you should be aware that there may be what is called specification errors. Specification errors simply means that your model was not specified correctly. Not specified correctly means that you did not choose the correct functional form. This simply means that you possibly omitted a variable. That's likely. For example, you're trying to run the yield on the fertilizer, but it may be misspecified because you desperately need in the model the rain. Of course, fertilizer affects, but it affects only when you actually have the real rain, right? You have the proper irrigation. So, you must have the rain in there in order for the model to be good. So, one type of typical specification error is you omit a variable which is statistically significant. You should be aware of those things. And the other is functional form. Well, I just drew you the functional form which is linear. But with fertilizer, no one, no farmer in the world expects the form to be linear, do they? No! They would expect to be non-linear. Early on, you gain a lot by using some fertilizer. And after some critical qual uh, quantity of fertilizer, then the yield levels off. Yes, it increases, but increases very little, all right? So, what you have is some type of a log function, might be a more appropriate function, or some quadratic function, all right? So, this will be, when you specify that the relationship is linear, when in reality it is not linear, you committed a specification error. And that is that you took the wrong functional form. So, you should be always aware any time you do a statistical or econometric analysis, am I missing some important variables and am I using the correct functional form? Isn't it sometimes like this as an exponential or like this as a log? Alright, is this good enough? Yeah. Yes. You want this some more? No. Oh, <laughs> you tired? Yeah. Alright, we're done for today. Whew.